So welcome to the BioInnovate Fellowship Programme informational webinar. My name is Brendan Staunton. Uh, I'm a previous BioInnovate Fellow from 2017, 2018, and I'm gonna be your host for the evening. So let's get going. So tonight we're gonna to give you more information on BioInnovate and how the organization has been responsible for the creation of over 32 medical device innovation projects and spin-outs. We'll also cover the biodesign process that the fellowship deploys. And we'll speak with two previous fellows, Barry McCann, CEO of Newa Surgical, and Caroline Gaynor, Principal at Limestone Ventures. We're going to finish with a Q&A with Professor Mark Rosie and Professor Martin O'Halloran, uh, both of whom are Executive Directors at BioInnovate. So if you have any questions, um, please put them in the, the Q&A tab that should be visible at the bottom of your screen. And we're going to spend 20 minutes uh, at the end on questions. So BioInnovate's mission is to be a leading global innovation hub educating the next generation of healthcare visionaries and entrepreneurs to positively impact lives everywhere. So a very ambitious goal. So central to this mission is the fact that BioInnovate sits at the intersection of academia, industry, and the clinic. Medical device innovation relies on the combined skills of a number of different specialities and collaboration is essential. So our location really reflects this need to work closely with other disciplines. As you can see, we're located in the heart of Galway, on the NUIG campus, close to the engineering and business school, and also a stone's throw away from Galway University Hospital, where some of our clinical immersion takes place. So we've had a number of different functions. The primary one we're going to talk about today is the Innovation Fellowship. We also have entrepreneurship and industry training, along with, along with uh, incubation and acceleration programs. So BioInnovate is funded by Enterprise Ireland, uh, NUIG, and a number of medical device businesses in the locality. We also collaborate with Stanford Biodesign, Oxford Biodesign, <clears throat> RISE, and a number of other European institutions. Uh, and the, the fellows throughout the fellowship actually engage uh, with these other organizations quite regularly. In terms of the ecosystem, the Translational Medical Device Lab, the Health Innovation Hub Ireland, and the Irish MedTech Association also play a key role uh, in, in developing that, that ecosystem. So the BioInnovate team is comprised of Professor Martin O'Halloran and Professor Mark Bruzzi, who we're gonna hear from later and also Professor Faisal Sharif and Anne Byrne, who is our administrator, who many of you probably have engaged with uh, already. So Ireland is the perfect place to develop medical device innovations that can have global impact. So we've got 450 medtech businesses in Ireland. We've one of the top five global medtech hubs. Uh, nine of the world's top 10 medtech businesses have a base here. We're actually the second largest exporter of medtech products in Europe, which accounts for about 10% of Irish exports. There's about 40,000 people employed and we're the second largest employer in the EU per capita. Uh, MedTech is also the most innovative sector in Europe based on patent filings and 10 of the world's top 10 biopharma and ICT companies have a base here. So the Stanford Biodesign process uh, is a method of medical device innovation. And the process was developed by a team of medical device entrepreneurs, clinicians and engineers who all had success developing medical device innovation. innovation. Um, and they took their learnings and developed the process to make it easier for future innovators like yourselves to be successful in this difficult and complex space. The first fellowship started in Stanford about 20 years ago, and innovations developed by the process have so far reached over 4 million patients. BioInnovate was established to bring Biodesign uh, and the fellowship to Ireland, and there are three main phases to the process, identify, invent and implement. Before we went to the process, just some details around the fellowship. It's a 10 month fellowship and the fellowship is split into three teams of four and each team uh, has a commercial expert, an engineer, a clinician, and then usually a scientist. Um, so this multidisciplinary team is really critical to the process. So coming together is a beginning, staying together is progress and working together is success. And that quote has never been more true um, when we talk about biodesign and the BioInnovate program. So this is where the magic happens, but it also is kind of the most difficult element of the process as people with different experiences and thought processes come together to solve a common problem. Uh, however, lots of help is provided around the team dynamics and the structure to ensure a good fit. Um, so moving on to the process, we'll start with the identify phase. Um, so it's really all about needs led innovation. So we don't build technologies and then try and fit them into markets. If you can take one thing from, from today's webinar, it's that we identify, uh, we identify real problems and validate those problems before going into solutions. 
So how do we do this? So the first thing we actually do is we immerse ourselves uh, in a clinical setting. So we spend 10 weeks in different hospitals around Ireland and abroad, and we're just looking for problems and as we call them needs. So we then develop them into need statements, which is a, a way for us to categorize those problems. For example, during, during my fellowship, we had about 420 needs uh, at the end of, of the process. Um, and they were from everything from a better way to dispose of a shark to a better way to complete uh, a, a specific procedure. So then we have all these needs, then we have to find a way to screen them. We're not gonna move into solution mode uh, around 400 needs. So we do filtering or need screening and we look at things like disease state, market analysis, competition, and burden of proof, and we filter those needs down. We also do a lot of stakeholder mapping on these problems. So we need to figure out how the problem actually affects the various different stakeholders, the payer, the patient, the clinician, you know, which, which stakeholder um, is, I suppose, struggling most with the problem. We also do a lot of procedure mapping. So this is quite a relevant procedure. This is actually a, a vaccination. Uh, relevant over the last two years that everyone's had. So we map the process, we look at all the different stakeholders, we identify the different pain points um, that are evident throughout that process. And that gives us a better understanding of the problems and, and the needs within that procedure. So once we've done our, our observations, as I said, it's about 10 weeks of clinical immersion, generally around Ireland. We then validate the needs that we've identified through the observations. We do more clinician interviews and really get to the root of those problems. And then we do other research around you know, trends, drivers, disease states. And all that research together results in, in what we call a need statement. And this is really the, the foundation of the biodesign process that the fellowship uh, implements. So a need statement um, is really a problem, uh, a population and an outcome. So a way to address a problem in a population that leads to a certain outcome. So some examples of a need statement, a way to reduce risk of reherniation after lumbar uh, disectomy for sciatica to reduce reoperation. So the clear problem, a clear population and a clear outcome. Another one, a safe, effective, minimally invasive way to treat pelvic organ prolapse in women to improve long-term surgical outcomes. So these are essentially the language of, of biodesign. Uh, and the, the need statements are really the, the basis of further research when we move into the next couple of stages. So once we've done the, invent, uh, the identify stage and we have, you know, we kind of whittle it down to about 10 needs in January. Once we have those 10 needs, then we move into the invent stage. Um, so this is kind of where the, the engineers really get to stand out. Throughout the process, there is different times where, you know, the different team members really get to lead the team. During the, the initial identify immersion stage, it's really a, a team effort to get out there and put the hours in um, trying trying to get the observations and needs. So during the invent stage, um, we create rough prototypes in kind of a rapid think, build, rethink sequence. Um, so failures really emerge early. So fail fast is another slogan you'll hear throughout the fellowship. Um, and this iteration leads to, to better solutions. Again, usually around 10 needs. So then we bring you through brainstorming and, and rapid ideation. So this is part of the process. We train uh, the teams how to brainstorm and how to identify solutions based on those needs. We then need to filter again, because um, obviously we can't have 10 solutions. So we use things um, like intellectual property, regulatory risk, business model and prototyping to, to further refine the need um, or the solution. So then we've into solution ideation. And you actually you know, sketch out your prototype. You have access to 3D printing. You're really allowed to, to be creative in your solutions. Um, and that's something that, that a lot of the, the engineering, um, I suppose, um, people really, really enjoy about the process. And importantly, then we have to go to, to even deeper level. We have to figure out how this solution is going to integrate into, into the healthcare system. The healthcare system, you know, particularly in America, has been described as the eight-headed monster. There's just so much going on there. And to actually have a product that you know, fills all those needs for the various different stakeholders is really important. So we do go into depth. This is an example here of a uh, nephrology um, solution. And this is the depth they went to in terms of actually understanding how their solution actually integ would integrate uh, into a healthcare system. The final stage then is the, the implement phase. Uh, so this is where the commercial people like myself uh, really have time to, to shine and put, you know, business plans together and kind of work on the more commercial elements. Um, so again, it's testing the technology, developing the approaches around patenting, regulatory reimbursement, uh, business models. So we do you know, a lot around kind of 
even the, the later stage things, how are we going to manufacture it? What sort of clinical trial do we need operationally? How are we going to run, run a potential business based on the solution? The finance required, you know, is it is it a ten million dollar raise? Is it is it a two million dollar raise? Um, and then obviously business plan. So when we get when we get to this point as well, this is where I suppose the complexity of the healthcare system really uh, I suppose bears its head. So we've got to talk about the technology. We've got to do IP searches to see whether there is any existing products. We have to look at reimbursement. Is there an existing code competition? You know, is there plenty of competition? Is there no one there that could equally be a sign that, that it isn't a, a worthwhile venture? Funding again, how much do we need? The market, uh, is it large enough to, to warrant another player? Is, is, it, is it large enough to actually develop a product? Regulatory risk, is it a class one, class two, class three? Again, stakeholders, sales. So there's really a lot going on, but I suppose the process helps you manage all these risks um, throughout the process. And for example, if a market wasn't right, you would have found that out at the start. So again, the needs-led innovation approach um, is really what, what we're hitting on here. So just in terms of the actual timeline of the fellowship, starts in August. Uh, we have boot camp, which is a pretty intense uh, month of, of learning. And um, we'll talk to some of the, the previous fellows and maybe they might um, give us some more information around that. We then go straight into clinical immersion in September and October. Again, we, I think we covered about 10 hospitals in our fellowship. Um, and it's, it's a very intense experience, but it's really, really rewarding. And um, some of the, the procedures and things you get to witness and, and the needs that you develop from that are, are invaluable. Then November, we move into need screening. So again, we're trying to reduce the amount of needs and pick out the good ones using those filters. Um, and then December, then we go back and validate with clinicians whether these needs are, are real needs. So January, we're, we're usually down to around 10 needs. I said, that's when we move into solution direction and actually trying to, um, to develop solutions and novel solutions around, around the problems. Um, March, then it's kind of moves towards business case prepar preparation in April. And then we also have the option then um, at the end to have either a diploma or a master's dissertation. So does the process work? Um, well, I think you'll see from this slide that there has been quite a lot of success in terms of companies actually being created after the process. Um, so, you know, the last number of years have seen a, a massive increase in that. Also, you know, that isn't the only reason people do the fellowship. We'll talk to Caroline uh, in a second as well about, about other advantages of doing the fellowship. It isn't, you know, it isn't all about spinning out a company. So just in terms of quantifying the success, we put 122 fellows. 130 entrepreneurs uh, trained in the process of medtech innovation over 11 years. We've accessed about 150 hospitals globally. We've engaged with 1,000 clinicians. We've covered 18 clinical areas. To date, there's about 32 technologies uh, who've been granted commercialization funding, which is kind of the next logical step after the fellowship. Um, we've identified over 3,000 unmet clinical needs. And to date, the spin out companies have raised over 150 million. Um, so that kind of sums up the bioinnovate. It kind of talks a little bit about the process. And now we're going to switch over and we're going to talk to Caroline Gaynor from Lightstone Ventures. Um, so let me just stop sharing. Caroline, welcome. Thanks. How are you? How are you? Good. My first question for you um, What did you do before you did bioinnovate and entered that crazy world? And what attracted you to the opportunity? Sure. So I guess to go back to the beginning, um, originally I trained as a pharmacist and after a couple of years working in, in the community setting, realized I, I wanted something a bit more meaty. Um, so looked into pharma and got my first gig with shearing back in the day. So started in clinical and regulatory affairs and actually my old CEO then recognized that maybe I had a bit of a, a sneaky business streak in me. So um, convinced me to move over to the business side of the house and originally started in female healthcare. Um, and again, probably seeking something more scientific, uh, pushed to move into oncology. So moved into the oncology business unit at that point. And um, at that time, Bayer had taken over, got to be part of pipeline planning um, on a global strategy team there, which was you know great fun. Um, as part of that, and again, I guess uh, so much of this happens just by chance in some way, but some of the people there 
realized that I, I might be good at health economics and market access. And that was becoming a really big focus for Bayer at the time. So they asked if I'd consider starting and heading up um, the market access reimbursement division of Bayer in Ireland, which I took on the challenge and have to say, I really did enjoy that role a lot. Did it for about three or four years over the entire portfolio of the company. Um, and, you know, at that point, they'd offered me a job over in the US and the leadership team on the market access. And it was then I, I really started doing a bit of soul searching about, you know, I had had quite a lot of experiences across very different divisions. And did I want to become niched um, and, you know, move into that big pharma role, uh, which essentially once once you go, you're probably there for, for a protracted period of time. Um, and I just decided ultimately that wasn't for me. I wanted to make the most of all my different learnings. and. Then came a period where I was trying to figure out, you know, how to capitalize upon that. So it was actually by chance. I remember sitting at my desk up there reading, I think it was the Medical Times or one of those mags, and there was a, a, an advertisement for bioinnovation. Um, and I remember reading it and seeing it was medical devices and, you know, thinking, sure, what would I know about that? I'm pharma girl through and through. Uh, it's been drugs all the way. But, you know, the more you think about innovation, the more of it really translates across. And OK, I wouldn't have the engineering piece, but I felt there'd be engineers on the program. And let's apply for it and see how we go and see if I have a skill set that resonates. And so I guess the, the rest is history. I still thank Mark for putting us through what was <laughs> a long day of interviews um, to get on the program, but essentially started it and uh, realized pretty quickly that, you know, we could definitely manage it. and. Um, it was one of the, the best things I've done, I think, uh, since then. So that's how, how I got to buy one Very good. I think there'll be a common theme tonight around just, you know, maybe you don't fit into the exact profile of commercial engineering. I mean, it is all about the interview process and, and you know, there is a range of different skill sets that are applicable to this process. Um, can you give me a quick overview on your fellowship experience, the problem area, the needs that you guys found, the process, the team, just a quick kind of, uh, sorry, there's a lot there, but uh, yeah, as much as you can on, on the process itself. Yeah, sure. So we had urology um, in our year. And so that was sort of split into your more traditional urology type topics and then also radiation oncology. Um, and, and I guess how urology would fit into that bucket. So we had quite a diverse clinical immersion experience, I would say. We got to see everything from pelvic floor reconstructions to, you know, many kidney removals, uh, BPH procedures, and then on the cancer side, you know, some prostate uh, cancer approaches and, um, yeah, just a very wide range. Um, and it, so, so the clinical immersion phase was quite intense, as you can imagine, um, but you do start to see patterns, right? And I think once you see a pattern, it triggers you to go seeking something else. And I do remember that, you know, we felt we'd seen, couldn't watch another BPH procedure. So let's go talk to the adjacent doctors and see if there's any other procedures we could get access to. And, and you start doing that towards the end of the procedure. And that was also very beneficial. So, um, yeah, so, so that was over the clinical immersion. And then we came up with many needs. Um, interestingly, some of them had nothing to do with urology. And I think that's a theme you'll find across all the various uh, years that there's some just universal problems that crop up no matter what therapeutic area you're dealing with um, and then came the process of whittling them down and in some respects that's the most challenging partly because you've only been experienced to the clinical scenarios in Ireland um, and there's that global question you know it's a need here but is it a need globally trying to get to the bottom of that you know and also trying to get to the bottom of what's the level of clinical evidence you'll need to move the needle in the space you're looking at and is it feasible really uh, to tackle that as a small startup so that's probably the hardest part um, of the process and the most hours put in um, but again working with the team through it and having the good and the good and bad moments was uh, all part of the process and big learning experience so um, ultimately we landed on uh, there a couple of different needs in our team um, the one we landed on for our final need, if you will, was overactive bladder. Um, and, you know, we, we thought we might bring that through ComFund, but then it became apparent we'd need to first and foremost do some PhD work to figure out some basic fundamentals about the approach you wanted to do. And so, you know, it became apparent it wasn't quite ready for comp funding. Um, so we didn't ultimately pursue that. Um, but then myself and Kyle, one of my teammates, took some IP out of uh, Mayo Clinic 
um, after that in the field of acute pancreatitis and pushed that one through um, funding um, and continued on that process for, I think it was 12, 18 months after. Took it to large animal studies and it didn't quite work as we expected. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, again, I think you're highlighting really diverse needs there, which is which is a definitely a, a key thing that I think we've all came across. It you know you're given an area, but you tend to not be be constrained by that area, which is which is a good thing. Um, so yeah, I suppose I talked about some of the successes in terms of the spin outs. Um, it'd be great to to hear kind of your path after Bio Innovate and what you're doing now and how I suppose Bio Innovate influenced that. Sure, absolutely. Um... I suppose BioNovate has fully influenced it because otherwise I would still likely be in pharma um, working in market access. So after BioInnovate, you know, I, I did want to try and take something forward. I think that was always something um, I'd wanted to do. And that was just to make the most of the, the background I've had and the learnings I've had. I thought you know, it could be helpful in a startup environment and um, being a bit of a generalist, I guess. Um, so, yeah, so the first project was that one in acute pancreatitis. Um, challenging indication and space, many issues. And, you know, I guess as we work through that project, through the Com Fund, it sort of, uh, for me at least, highlighted the value of the Com Fund and what it's there for, that you're really able to de-risk a program, gives you the time and space to answer those fundamental questions to help you decide, is this actually worth, you know, taking out of college and using investor money to push forward, or is there just too many barriers? Um, and in our case, there's ultimately too many barriers and the, the case didn't add up. Um, and so we, we, I think, ended that one project early. Um, and then after that, I joined Mark at VTEX and annoyed him for some time as clinical commercial lead. And that was a very exciting phase for VTEX, um, at the, trying to plan the early clinical days and you know, get the device to the point that we are happy to go out and seek that seed round. Um, and it was at that, I was part-time with that, and I'd also um, come across the guys at the foundry and it was originally helping them out they they had pulled me in on a couple of projects um, one was around what is now fire one was trying to you know diligence some ideas for what that company could be um, and it was actually through that I got to know Lightstone and um, honestly never had any intentions of joining venture knew it was a space I knew nothing about uh, for sure um, and it was always that one area that sort of, I reckoned I should probably scale up on if you're to go down the, the, the company route and just understand um, the mechanics of all of that. So originally they asked if I'd join as an EIR um, and the original ambition there is, you know, you, as you're looking for ideas, if there's something you'd like to lead, well then you can do that. Um, but I guess maybe it turned out I was, I was okay at the diligence process and could grab my hands around some of the concepts of venture. So you know, they ultimately asked that I join their investment team, which I did, and I'm three years in that role now and still liking it, um, still lots to learn, very different, but I guess it gives you a great sense of what makes a good company when you just see so many, so many pitches, so many companies, um, and certainly, you know, <laughs> yeah, still continue to learn there, so I guess that's where I am right now, and yeah. Yeah, journey. fascinating journey. Um, Last question, what advice would you give to someone who is considering uh, doing the fellowship this year? Um, if you're good at telling you to do it, do it. Um, it's pretty traumatizing leaving a big job, I know. I certainly questioned myself for about three weeks uh, that I was destroying my career forever, you know, um, leaving the big paycheck if nothing else. But, you know, sometimes it's worth taking the risk. I'm very glad I did and met all the phenomenal people I did on bioinnovation. Just the, the network it opens you to and you know gives you the opportunity to explore a totally different way forward for yourself, um, which you know at the end of it may or may not work out in the way you thought, um, which is fine. But I do think it's absolutely worth the the just the risk and jump in there and just see how it goes. But yeah, don't be afraid to do that and expect it to feel uncomfortable. <laughs> Meant to. Okay, uh, thanks so much guys. If anyone has any questions for, for Caroline, can you please put them in the chat and we'll get them. Are you okay to hang around for a few minutes, Caroline? Just yeah, yeah, just... yeah, no, I'm good to wait. Barry, you've been waiting patiently there for, for your turn in the hot seat. Um, I'll start with the same question. Um, what were you doing before by Innovate and what, I suppose, attracted you to, to the opportunity? Uh, hi, Brent, it's good to see you. Um, 
what was I doing beforehand? Um, I suppose uh, I, I've kind of always considered myself someone who wasn't the normal kind of fit for bioinnovate. And uh, you and I have had this conversation numerous times, but um, my whole background is, I suppose, kind of commercial and um, fundraising management. So I really wasn't in the, the medical or medical device space at all. Um, I did a commerce degree back in NUI in 2000. And really since then, uh, the majority of my career would have been in the not-for-profit space, um, working for various charities um, and always in that kind of business development fundraising role. Um, the, the role I left to come into BioInnovate was a business development manager with Connacht Rugby. So again, completely different to, to moving into this space. Um, and it was a role I really loved. I mean, I'd been involved playing rugby for years. I'd worked in, in previous clubs before that. Um, and I think that was really the a big challenge for me was leaving something that I absolutely loved um, to, to go to BioInnovate and probably kind of create a lot of hesitation. But um, I knew it was also an opportunity that I couldn't really give up once I, I'd actually been accepted onto the programme. Um, I actually became aware of BioInnovate probably five or six years before that. Um, and it was while I was fundraising manager at uh, Cree, the heart and stroke charity. Um, and the fellows in their first or second year had come in and they were doing clinical immersion um, at the heart and stroke center. Um, and I was chatting to Paul Anglum at the time and just trying to get an, an understanding of what the guys were in for. And I just really found it fascinating. So for five or six years, I kind of just followed uh, loosely the progress of, of what was happening and um, I suppose I had made a, the decision that I wanted to move into the healthcare space. I, I, when I was working in Cree, I, I was working alongside, I suppose, some of the major, major pharma uh, and medtech multinationals, but I was always coming from the not-for-profit side and asking them to come on board to do something with us or to fund something. Um, I was fascinated by that space and wanted to kind of find my way into it. And yeah, BioInnovate ended up being that, that journey, that route into it. That's brilliant. Yeah, again, I mean, the, the right fit. I mean, you didn't have any med tech experience and, you know, the process uh, afterwards, you're now the CEO of a medical device company. So <laughs> there's obviously something to be said there about confidence as well that it gives you throughout the process. Um, can you give us a little overview on your fellowship experience, the problem area and just kind of the, the ins and outs of it? Yeah, um, well, I suppose it's... Um, anything that I get wrong you can correct because you were alongside me my partner in crime for the whole thing so um for for everybody that's kind of listening in um like you and I were on the the, the same uh, obstetrics and gynecology team uh back in 2017 so um along with two others we worked um all very closely um for the duration of, of the, the project or for the duration of the fellowship until it was time to kind of I suppose, pivot and find our own kind of directions. And um, in I actually kind of researched, uh, or kind of went back through some of the notes of, um, I suppose, some of the hours that we put in, in in clinical immersion. And it was it was staggering to look back through it that we had, in the short space of time of about kind of eight or nine weeks um, at various hospitals around Ireland, I think we'd, we had spent nine weeks in 10 different hospitals, but between the four of us, we'd covered over a thousand hours of clinical immersion. Um, that was over 400 procedures between us uh, and um, spent time alongside over 200 infants in, um, uh, in, in the, the neonatal intensive care units. And you kind of look back in that in a short space of time, you're given this access in BioInnovate that is pretty much impossible to come by anywhere else and uh, you know we were just uh, allowed to kind of um, look over the sh shoulder of surgeons and, and clinicians and just trying to get an understanding of some of the problems so um, that was really I suppose staggering for me is, is kind of looking back at how much we covered in such, such a short space of time and um, to go back to the start I, like, I suppose you've given a really good overview of the program that boot camp was was it was crazy it was intense but I have to say coming from my own background and you know this I was completely lost and I did feel out of my depth um 
I, I, I had to kind of go home and always read up about what the hell we had done that day. Um, and it was just my way of kind of catching up on myself and catching up on, on, I suppose, what was going to happen for the clinical immersion for the next few weeks. Um, so it, it really was intense. What you'd learned during the day was intense. And then you would kind of go home and really have to kind of, I suppose, prepare yourself for what's coming next. Um, I was just after having, I think, my, my second child and Teddy was six months old. So that was kind of thrown into the mix as well. My kind of wife knew that, Okay, this is going to be nine or ten months of 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 mayhem and she wasn't going to expect me around for a lot of it um it it ended up i suppose being all of that it it it, it was intense we were um having to to i suppose travel the country attend um various i suppose uh hospitals and clinician um appointments and things like that but that was all for the first couple of months of it until we kind of settled down into the the i suppose the needs filtering phase and when we came out of our uh, clinical immersion brand i think we had over 500 um observations and then when we filtered that down it was 400 un unmet clinical needs all in obstetrics and gynecology um so we spent months then just filtering all that down to i suppose one two three needs that i suppose three of the participants on within our team alone, we all went and, I suppose, uh, secured comm funds on. Yeah, uh, it was um, it was definitely an intense experience, all right. And as you said, there is, you know, a little bit of catching up to do if you don't have the medical device. But I suppose having good teammates uh, always helps, right? And the fact we're still friends is definitely... An <laughs> yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, there's plenty of questions been asked around uh, the table in the evening. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what did you do after the fellowship? Um, I suppose even kind of, I suppose I'm, if we took it back to maybe two or three months before the end of the fellowship, once our team had kind of settled on, I suppose, key needs and needs that really had uh, uh, commercial opportunities and, and were potentially viable um, startups, three of us went our own ways and we... Um, we looked to champion a separate need each. So in my case, it was really um, complications that were following cesarean delivery. Um, it was something that we had picked up during the year. And then as we kind of digged deeper through it, surgical site infections following C-section is unfortunately a very common occurrence. Um, so that was kind of the direction that I went down uh, looking for, I suppose, a solution for that. Um, now, knowing that each of my team members were tackling a different need and my own background being, uh, I suppose, a commercial background, I needed engineers that were going to come with me and actually try and, and develop a solution for this. So um, I'd written a, a commercialization fund application and I suppose in the process just had been working on um, a, a network that currently had and uh, had built throughout BioInnovate. Um, to uh, secure, I suppose, partners or, or, or co-founders to come on board and join me for that journey um, if we were going to be successful for getting a comm fund. Um, very fortunate. I know it's a really competitive process, but it was fortunate to secure that comm fund. Um, it, it provided us with, I suppose, a, a funding runway for two years to be based at NUI Galway uh, and identify uh, the proper solution that was going to kind of, I suppose, tackle the need and tackle the problem that we'd identified. Um, so that was, it was a phenomenal experience. So again, I kind of have that support and have that, nearly that comfort blanket of, we've got a little bit of a runway here. We've got kind of the backing of Enterprise Ireland to go and do this without needing to go out and get really early uh, investment or, or funders behind us when we didn't know if, if our solution was going to work. And we really had to kind of, I suppose, nail down on a, on a proper solution. Um, so only, it was only, I suppose, at the end of 2020 that that commercialization fund had finished. And the last year we've been kind of out on our own and um, I suppose entering various competitions as Newer Surgical uh, is the, the spin out company. And um, really, it's just a case of secure as much smart funding as possible to meet as many milestones as we can. Um, and uh, we're also in, in the process of, of raising a, a, 
an investment funding round as well. Very good. And what, what are your ambitions then for, for New Surgical for the next two to three years? What's, what's the grand plan? Um, what's going to be key for us really is getting, um, I suppose, human data as, as soon as possible. But um, um, after that, it's, um, it, it's getting our FDA uh, submission and getting FDA clearance. So that's going to be really key. Um, we're very close to, to hitting our design freeze now at the moment. Um, so from there on, we, we can kind of we can map out a very clear plan of how long each activity is going to take until we can get to FDA submission. Um, so yeah, a lot of really exciting milestones, hopefully in the next kind of 12 to 18 months that are ahead of us. Um, you know, we're just trying to get as accurate with our budgeting as possible, take on the right amount of money um, and just build as many kind of good partnerships around us as well. Um, you know, certainly the aim is to, at some stage, um, be acquired so that our solution can actually be taken at a global stage. And I think it's, it's going to be required that if we want to impact all 29 million C-sections around the world, it's going to be a bigger player that's going to do that. Um, so there's, I suppose that there's no hiding the fact that we do want to be noticed by the bigger players and we've got kind of key milestones to achieve to, to make that happen. Amazing journey from, from the fellowship in 2017 to where you are now and, and best of luck over the next couple of months and years. Um, final question, what advice would you give to someone who is considering the fellowship this year? Yeah, I think um, like Caroline touched on it. It's, if your gut is telling you to, to go for it, um, at the end of the day, it's 10 months. And um, it, it's not only is it 10 months that's, you know, you're, you're kind of, cutting off all of your own salary it is supported there is the stipend you're it's it, it's funded um it's an unbelievable challenge and i think um i mean for me uh, i'm an absolute supporter of the bio innovate process because there was no way in hell that i'd get to where i am now without it and and that's guaranteed i think you know the access we had the support the networks um and then the network that's still there for us you know anytime there's there's queries i go back to you know other alumni and, and i figure out and just today i was i was asking a load of them about um what do we do at certain kind of human trials or who have they used for various things with suppliers so that support network is is phenomenal uh, for for kind of a small group of cohort of about 120 people it's so supportive um, so yeah, I think you know, go with your gut, um, and uh, it's it's an, an unbelievable experience. Um, brilliant. Um, I think I think that's another thing that highlights as well as that support network. Maybe I didn't touch on that. As you said, even other 120 people all on the same journey as you, all being through the same uh, same experience, and that support that we we give each other is is pretty invaluable. So it is it does get you into a club, uh, which uh, hopefully will. We'll have some success um, in the near future with companies like, like uh, New Surgical. So we'll move to the, the Q&A section. Um, so if anyone has any questions, please put them in, in the chat now. Um, someone in straight away, how much is the stipend? Mark, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you take that one if that's all right. Sure, um, thanks Brendan. Um, the stipend is, is uh, 30,000 per year. Uh, however, there is registration fees with the university which are approximately five to 6,000 per year. Um, and the purpose of this stipend really is to allow people to leave their jobs and come on the program for a 10 month duration. Um, so essentially this stipend is there just to give some living expenses and as a landing pad for, for people really to, to consider what their next steps are. Okay, thank you. Uh, Martin, I'll, I'll direct this one at you. Um, how are the teams assigned to uh, the various areas? Yeah, so um, I would say a lot of due diligence is done in advance on the clinical area. So we, we, we spend a couple of months just figuring out areas that are, I suppose, open for innovation and um, where we can get good clinical access and where we think that um, investor funds may follow. So each year we pick three different clinical areas and then we try and match skill sets of the team to the particular clinical area. But I, I guess it's our goal that each of the clinical areas 
are equally attracted to investment and are equally open to open for in, uh, innovation. Okay, uh, I'll keep on. I'll keep with you, Martin. Um, what budget do you get to explore an unmet need? So I think the question is kind of, do you get budget during the fellowship to to look further? Yeah. So so it's essentially the stipend is your salary for the year and um, really what you're given is just a lot of time and support in, in the filtering process I think Brendan you made a great point about you're starting with 450 or sometimes 500 needs and you're trying to find that one need and if you think about what that is that's the top half percent right not even the top one percent of needs in terms of commercial opportunity um, so Sometimes I think we tend to recruit really good people, really talented people. And if you didn't support them at all and just give them a year to figure out a business, they'd probably do, do something great regardless. But what we're also doing is giving you clinical access, um, mentor support, and then the knowledge of having worked with 28 to 30 companies before and feeding that back through. So it, I think what you're really getting is just a really good environment to innovate. Um, and if you're interested in starting, a comp starting up a company, and there's a huge support there as well. Okay, uh, thanks, Bill Martin. Caroline, um, question for you. What are the common pitfalls you see fellows face in the first couple of weeks? Um, not sure there's too many. I mean, the first couple of weeks is mostly all about boot camp um, and getting to know the team. I mean, maybe some people might find that part hard depending on where they're coming from you're working in a quite intense environment um with a small team but other than that I, I don't think there's too many pitfalls to be found I mean it's all material that's being brought to you and you'll get out of it what you put in um so if you're approaching it with the right mindset I would I, I do, yeah I'm not sure I don't see too many pitfalls in the first while certainly as you're you know filtering out those needs there's plenty of pitfalls but uh yeah you, you are you do have your hand kind of held for the first yeah. couple of weeks with the boot camp and you are kind of you know all the training is provided so it's pretty much just put the errors in for, for the first exactly. couple of um barry question here for you uh from adele let me just find it here um Thank you, Caroline and Barry, for sharing real authentic experiences and your own journeys. Any advice for someone with a broad commercial background without a med tech background? Barry, you're probably best positioned to, to talk about that. I know you've touched on it already, but maybe just a quick response. Um, yeah, I, I think probably it's, it's really just, I suppose, take all of the info that's been thrown at you, um, digest as much of it as you can, and put in the extra hard yards kind of uh, behind the scenes as well. And I think that's really, uh, that was a big part of it for me, uh, especially in, in the medical side of it. Um, but uh, it took a while, but I absolutely got there. And I think that can be the exact same for you, Dale. Okay, thanks, Barry. Mark, just one for you here. Um, what differentiates getting the diploma versus a master's from the program? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think the program is aimed towards um, innovation, and this doesn't always fall in directly with uh, academic qualifications. Uh, we allow uh, participants to register uh, as students within the program. It's a requirement, actually. Most uh, candidates will register straight up for a diploma, but there is the option for some to uh, take on an extra academic workload um, in terms of a master's activity. And really with a master's activity, you're trying to answer or address a research question. Uh, I think I won't be able to answer that in a short snippet, but um, just to say that the program is really more aligned towards a, a diploma type of activity, um, but there is the opportunity to, to register for a master's for those who want to go that extra step. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll stick with you, Mark, for a sec, just a few quick ones. Are international applicants welcome? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, and then there's a lot of questions around kind of, um, I suppose, the experience required. Um, do you need a degree was one question as well. Can you maybe touch a little bit on that? Um, I think Martin might have answered that question, but, um, you know, we evaluate each candidate for their ability to innovate um, and their ability, ability to um, contribute to a team which is fo focused on healthcare innovation. So it does require a lot of research. Um, and uh, I, I think from a, an academic qualification point of view, 
normally we take people in with uh, degrees or higher level degrees even, um, but more so uh, experience. And uh, we look for people with experience to be able to execute on projects, but also to be able to innovate. Okay, perfect. Um, let me just have a look through here. Um, what do they typically cover? Barak, and I'll ask with this one to you. What do they typically cover as part of the immersion? Does it involve prior, primarily hospital, uh, hospital activity and visits, or does it also involve any course coursework related to medicine? Are you asking me? Um, yeah. yeah. So I think that's a really, a really interesting question. So what you want is that you see the entire patient journey. Uh, so you want to be in the outpatient clinic, you want to be in surgery, you want to understand you know, how the patient is treated after, you know, when they go home. And so all of the problems and all of the challenges that arise across those environments. So one of the things that we focus on is getting really good clinical champions who will, I suppose, guide that process. But if you want to, I suppose, come up with something very innovative, you need to see um, how the patients are managed across all different environments. So we try to have as much diversity in the clinical immersion as possible. Okay. Um, let me just see, there's another one here. Um, yeah, this one is for, I'll go to Caroline again. Um, question for the past fellows. At what point did you pivot from the final set of needs to a viable idea and startup team? So I think it's kind of, at what point do you break off and uh, run for the hills is the question. <laughs> I think, well, it starts becoming apparent as you whittle them down to the top few. Um, and then at that point as well, you know, each team member will have developed an opinion on whether it's for them to keep going and enter that startup environment or whether they, you know, want to move back maybe towards what they were doing before or take a different direction. So I think that all starts happening, at least in our um, intake. And if I can go back 10 years and remember, I think it was about April, Easter time. Um, I think there was that natural sort of people figuring out what they wanted to do um, and deciding, you know, if there were folks they particularly had a good working relationship with on the team who were equally motivated to take stuff forward. Um, that all sort of starts coming together around then. Um, and then thereafter, then you're crafting the, the plan forward or coming up with how you see the next steps um, happening. And if that's a common fund, then... That's uh, typically something you apply for probably after the program over the over the summer. OK, yeah, I think from Barry, you probably echo this from our experience as well, that it kind of depends on the team and the needs. And if someone feels really strongly about a need, they might kind of, you know, break away a little bit earlier. But, you know, everyone is encouraged to kind of finish the program as a team. And I think, you know, as I said in, in the presentation, that's where the real value is, is that multidisciplinary team and all those different um, experiences going together. Mark, I'll, I'll jump to you just about the interviews. People are asking, uh, are they in person and what is the interview process? Um, yes, thanks. Uh, maybe I'll talk about the um, application process first of all. Yeah. We're looking for expressions of interest where people will submit their CV um, and then we will review CVs and invite people, uh, some people, not all, uh, to submit full applications. Within that application, we're looking for people to explain a little bit more about their experience and why they want to come on uh, the BioInnovate program. Uh, what is their motivation? Then when we get to interview, we uh, have a, a short list that we invite. And um, without giving too much away, we're looking to get to know the person. We're looking to really understand what motivates a person, how they re react in stressful environments, uh, and also how they can contribute to a team. Um, so we have a full day of interviews, which is a combination of one-on-one -on -one interviews as well as group activities. Okay, and another question <clears throat> related to that is kind of, when will you know if you are successful or unsuccessful just from a time frame point of view? And also just one follow-up question around, do you have an exact start date in August? Is it the start, middle or end? Um, so maybe the, the second question first, we do have a start date. Uh, I just don't have it to hand, but it's in the middle of August, um, just uh, um, before the academic uh, year kicks off. It's a nice time to start within the university because we get access to cadaver labs. And we also get to run the boot camp activity without with minimum disruption. 
So middle of August start date, we seek to inform candidates, bef- you know, towards the, the start of June. That's our target. Okay. And on average, how many applications do you receive each year? We receive well over oh, 100. Um, I can't remember last year exactly the number, but I would suspect it was closer to the 200. Uh, so it is a, a competitive process, but I would say that because we're looking for different disciplines, people with different backgrounds, we categorize people and evaluate people in different ways. Okay. Caroline, question directly for you. Uh, I'm an aircraft engineer looking to make the jump into medical device sector. What advice would you give as someone who's changed careers? Um, so I think depending on you know your past experience, it just becomes about how much can you bring to you know the, the company as you see it taking that forward. So for me, it was you know pharma moving into med tech. When you think about that process and finding a need, developing a concept, and then all that commercial piece, a lot of that sort of translated quite well, um, with the exception of maybe the engineering piece, right, which was a steep curve and I probably know you know five percent of the lingo at this stage but it's just understanding what you're bringing from your current job that can actually translate well into a different setting and certainly for for me as it transpired the pharma experience and all those different roles I've had through clinical regulatory market access reimbursement and indeed the commercial and strategic piece you know all of that is fundamentally sort of the same um the product is different but but the process is the same and the things you think about are the same. So, I mean, if you feel that that's something you can bring with you, I wouldn't be necessarily too worried about the technical piece. There's other skill sets and knowledge bases you can bring to this project outside of the, you know, fundamental engineering part of it, which is also incredibly important, but there'll be that skill set on the team um, to bounce off as well. So, yeah, for me, it's, it's, it's just about how translatable is what you have into this new way forward. Thanks, Caroline. Um, Martin, quick question for you. Um, Brenda mentioned that setting up a company is not the only other career path on offer. Uh, can you talk about some of the other paths that you feel this course contributes to um, with a focus for engineers? Yeah, yeah. Like uh, probably Caroline, you're probably better uh, place to talk about this, but I think really what you what you do, what you learn about is um, I would say you become a really good critic of um, medical innovations. So you, be, you, get, you develop a really good eye for what a good investment opportunity is or what a good research project looks like. So that, you know, a lot of the big med tech companies, Boston, Medtronic, Abbott, now train a lot of their R&D staff in biodesign. And so, you know, some, some of our graduates will go in and into those departments and work on new product development within the large multinational corporations. Some end up um, working for investment companies looking for new opportunities. But what I would say is it's really, really great training on terms of identifying what an investable business opportunity looks like in medtech. And so where you go from there really is, is, is really up to your own personal, I suppose, career ambitions. You know, some, some go the startup route, some go to multinationals, some go, um, uh, down the investment route. Okay. Um, Mark, I'll, I'll throw one final question over to you. Um, is there a platform for submission of IP provided during the project? So, uh, you know, just maybe talk a little bit around the IP, around solutions that are developed within the program and how that works. Sure. Um, so this is a university-based program and um, we're funded by a state agency, Enterprise Ireland, which in a state uh, university. So all the IP developed on the program um, becomes the ownership of the university. Um, the opportunity really is to stay within the university environment and to maximize grant funding that can come in while you're in this university environment prior to spinning out. So the motivation from the university is for people to exploit the IP, to create um, new startups, uh, to allow existing companies to to license uh, research that has been developed in the university. Um, so really, the oppor- uh, it's a double-edged sword in many ways. Um, you know, we're funded by the U- university and the state, so the IP belongs to the university, but really the university is motivated to license it to uh, companies to exploit in the future. 
And I think that's what a lot of candidates uh, look to do. Okay, thank you. Um, another question here, um, it's around accommodation. Um, so do you get hotels to stay or do you have to manage your own living with the stipend? So the answer to that is the stipend is there to cover your living uh, expenses while you're in Galway. Mark, are all the teams expected to be based in Galway this year? Is that a... Uh, yes, yes. I mean, that is an expectation. And I think the last couple of years, we've all had to live with uh, virtual work uh, environments. And uh, I think that's appropriate for various different stages of the program. But I think the boot camp activity, the clinical immersion has to be in person. Okay. Um, will the initial training boot camp cover how to uh, how startup funding is accessed? Um, maybe I'll just continue with the, with the theme yeah. here. Um, we used to do that. And uh, I think it became a fire hose of information uh, when really people were trying to understand uh, what problems they were going to look to solve. So we spread that out to later in the year in the boot camp. We really try and prepare people for going into the hospitals, for identifying clinical needs that align with good market opportunities um, that have the potential uh, to innovate around. And I think later in the year when people have those needs and have initial innovation concepts uh, to address those clinical needs that's when we start talking to them about the pathway of uh, getting investment uh, after the program and after any research grant that may come in to support them okay well i'll do two more questions and then, then we'll call the night um what percentage of past fellows would have gone back to their original role that's a good question actually i'd say it's quite low what do you what do you think uh, yeah um I'd say it's very low. Uh, I'd say there's probably another subset who went back to their same employer, but in a different role. Um, and then I'd say a majority of people either go to other smaller startup companies, state organizations, venture capital. Um, of course, the, the, the medics uh, often go back to their medical career, but with a different lens. And uh, then there's a good probably 40 to 50 percent who go on and take projects forward. Okay. Um, okay, well, listen, thank you very much, everyone, for your participation. Really interesting conversation. Mark, do you want to close up with some closing remarks just about where they can actually apply and kind of the deadlines, maybe? Sure. Uh, all the information is on the website, uh, bioinnovate.ie. And uh, we would encourage people, if they have interest and want to talk to us more about um, the, the program, uh, please submit your CVs and uh, we'll be in touch. Cool. Thank you very much, guys. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye.